Um, this is the existing service, pretty marginal, you know, and, and uh, geez, it's almost an overnight trip from Kansas City to Chicago on the, on the railroad now. But, uh, but in theory, uh, you know, we could get these travel times down to, uh, to uh, reasonable. Now, I guess what I was going to say is that we'll see in the mega regions, we'll see uh, true high speed service, 175 to 220 mile per hour service, which is what the rest of the world is doing. Now, we are behind at this point, not just the Japanese and the Brits and the Germans you know, we're, uh, and the Chinese. We're now behind the Moroccans and the Brazilians and the South Africans and the Indians and the Vietnam is moving ahead with a high speed rail program. And it does raise the question at some point, you know, uh, maybe we're doing something right or maybe these 20 some odd countries that have already done these things are doing something wrong. And I think it's probably that, uh, that you know, that we're, that we're, we're not thinking this through. We need to move ahead with this. Um, so this is the president's, you know, vision uh, last week. And I think what we're going to find tomorrow, we're all waiting to see what the vice president says. But I think we'll see that the, they'll be proposing a down payment on this on this system, um, uh, you know, and again, we work out the arithmetic, we basically need to be investing about $20 billion a year if we're going to achieve, achieve this vision uh, to, to create the high-speed rail framework. But think of it as, a, as, as the backbone of a whole new mobility system for the United States that, that has high-speed, you know, 175, 220 mile per hour services in the mega regions, that has, uh, has connecting systems that, that cut across from Denver, you know, th through uh, Manhattan or through Wichita to Kansas City, and then connect to Chicago, where you'd get a, where you'd connect probably across the platform transfer enough time to pick up your Kansas City Star and your Cappuccino and get on the train to a high-speed train to Chicago, and you'd be in Chicago uh, in a couple of hours. Um, and think of what that does to the economy and the mobility and the accessibility of a place like this. Um, uh, you know, so uh, so this is basically where. You know what the what the administration has proposed, and actually there's a little more detail where they've proposed other connecting services, um, and uh, um, and what else can I say about it? Um, you know we've been uh, just last week the the uh, chairman Micah, the new new uh, chairman of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, came to New York, and and uh, Petra Todorovic uh, uh, from our staff uh, testified along with Governor Rendell and Mayor Bloomberg and so forth. And what they're looking for, what the, the new Republican leadership in the House is looking for, for three things. You know, one is uh, they want to see private investments. So that so that let's assume that it's half a trillion dollars. That in fact, uh, you know, we think from based on the experience in other countries that that ultimately the private sector might be able to come up, you know, with 20 or 25 uh, percent of the total cost of this thing. That still means that the government's got to come up with 400 billion dollars out of the total. But what I think Chairman Mike is looking for is the kind of rigor and the market savvy that the private sector can provide and, and, and doing these projects as, as P3s. He's looking for an expedited uh, permitting process, which we all are. You know, the Chinese are building these things in three to five years. The Brits are building them in 10 to 12 years. And we're, if we're lucky, building them in 30 years. It's just not good enough. And so we need to, to expedite the environmental reviews and procurement and eliminate red tape. Um, and um, and and, and, and basically, he's looking for us to kind of match the, the level of investment both on the public and the private side that, um, that, that the rest of the world is making. Um, you know, a little glimpse at the Northeast, and we, uh, we kind of kick-started thinking about the Northeast high-speed rail uh, last year. This is a map of the Northeast that, that uh, portrays population density as these, these, uh, these you know, mountains, and you see that New York City is Mount Everest, and this, and we, this is kind of a fun graphic that looks at the rest of the country as well. But you can see the potential here to, to link these very dense population centers in the Northeast um, with, with high-speed rail to create synergies. This was the report that my students at Penn came out with last, last year. Uh, which after 40 years of Amtrak telling us that we couldn't have, you know, a, a true high-speed rail, 175 mile per hour service, we had to live with the, you know, Acela, the Acela service currently averages, I think it's 69 miles per hour between Boston and New York and 79 miles per hour between New York and D.C. Just not good enough. It's half the speed of the rest of the world's high-speed rail system. So we came up with, you know, uh, uh, our own proposal for two dedicated tracks running the length of the corridor. We actually cited it. Uh, figured out where it could fit in the existing corridor, where we'd new, need new right away, and laid the whole thing out. And this is what we came up with, you know, uh, with with half of it in the existing, in the existing right away. It fits basically from Washington to New York. We can do most of it in the existing right away. Uh, we can use highway rights of way for sections of it, where we've got limited access highways and we've got the ability to squeeze it in. Little, some of it on rail freight, and the big thing is tunnels. About 20% of it using the the 
automated tunnel boring machines that were invented for the Channel Tunnel 30 years ago, which are now used routinely. We got six of these things, you know, uh, grinding away, building new subway lines in New York uh, uh, 24 hours a day now. And that's what the rest of the world is doing. This is the, the right-of-way in the south. It basically uses the existing northeast corridor right-of-way, but it departs from the right-of-way in some key locations where we've got S-curves and constricted, you know, uh, a corridor with a lot of urban development, and using the tunnel boring machines, we come up under Philadelphia Airport, build a new station under the main terminal at Philadelphia Airport, get real synergies between the rail system and the, and the, and the airports uh, up and down the East Coast, and this can happen all over the country, and then a new station in the Market East area of downtown Philadelphia, which has been underperforming now for half a century, and create a new kind of focal point for economic development in Philadelphia. And in the north, half, we've got a problem. This stretch from, from uh, New Rochelle here uh, to, uh, to Westerly, Rhode Island is very narrow, very windy, very congested. They're filled with commuter rail trains from New Haven into New York and so forth. And everybody agrees it's going to be hard to shoehorn uh, two new high-speed rail tracks into that corridor. Could be done, but it would be very expensive and very disruptive. So, you know, we're, you know, we're academics or university. We can, you know, to take a few liberties, so we said, why don't we use some unused rights of, freight rights of way in New York City and east of the city, tunnel under the uh, NIMBY suburbs, uh, and, uh, and then hit a set of employment centers on Long Island. There's seven million people living on Long Island, so why shouldn't they have access to the high-speed rail system? And then uh, stop at, the, at SUNY Stony Brook, which is the land-grant university in Long Island, and, uh, and then tunnel under the sound uh, to west of New Haven and then use existing Amtrak right away and then a highway right away to get us into, get us into Boston and then run a figure eight service. The blue is the existing uh, uh, Amtrak Acela service. You know, we run a very leisurely, very beautiful, uh, get out some uh, linen tablecloths and some nice champagne and people can enjoy the view of, of, of the Atlantic Ocean and Long Island Sound and on their slower route uh, from Providence. And now needless to say, I'm not a very popular guy in Providence and, uh, and I live in Stamford, Connecticut, so my, my, my neighbor, the new governor of Connecticut, is not real happy with me. But uh, at any rate, so we put it on the table. We basically have said, you know, let's, let's look at all the alternatives. And uh, so the great thing about this whole uh, process, we did a service plan that showed how you could cut travel times in half, hour and a half from New York to D.C., hour and 45 minutes from New York to Boston, um, and then a set of intermediate services, high speed, uh, 12 trains an hour on each track. You know, from the two trains an hour that we run now, uh, intercity services, uh, so it's like a thousand percent increase in capacity, and it would run like the Shinkansen does in Japan. If you've ever been to Japan, nobody ever runs for these high-speed rail trains. Anybody know why that is? There's always one coming later. There's always one coming in five minutes, and and there's no reserved seating. You just get on the train, and uh, you know most people using the trains have weekly and monthly passes, and so they really they're you know they just get on the next get on the next train. Thank you. Extra bonus points. Uh, so give this, woman, give this woman an A, whatever she's studying. Uh, uh, so this is the forecast we did of, did of ridership. Now, the great thing is that you know, about two-thirds of the way through the Penn study last spring, uh, we'd been working with uh, Amtrak and with their engineers at AECOM, the big civil engineering firms, and getting advice from them and so forth. And about two-thirds of the way through the project, uh, the, the guy, Al Engel, who ran the, the uh, uh, AECOM's high-speed rail uh, uh, program and, and was consulting with Amtrak came to me and he said, would it be okay if he went to uh, uh, Joe Boardman, the president of Amtrak, and pitched the idea of Amtrak doing their own version of our study? I said, sure, that's what we're here for. We really here take everything, you know, and, and so forth. And they turn, turned around and, and AECOM, uh, you know, then uh, desi designed a kind of punched up version of the, of the Penn project. Uh, and, uh, and then in the, in the you know, the other thing that happened that was kind of fun is that the Philadelphia Inquirer, you know, ran a story about this crazy group of students in, at, at Penn, and Ed Rendell, uh, the governor of Pennsylvania, calls me the next day, says, uh, you know, one of these calls that you like to get, what are you doing tomorrow at 2 o'clock? I said, I don't know, Governor, what am I doing tomorrow at 2 o'clock? He said, you're bringing your students down to visit with me. Uh, in, in, in Philadelphia, and we're going to talk about your high-speed rail plan. So we're going through this, and Ed's a really dynamic, you know, things happen right away kind of guy. And the next thing I know, we're sitting there, and he's got the vice president of the United States on the speakerphone. So I got a bunch of kids here from Penn, and, 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 and uh, uh, hey, Joey, you wouldn't believe it, but these kids from my alma mater have just done what Amtrak said we couldn't do. We can do a high-speed rail thing in the Northeast. You got to see it. And the next thing you know, the stu students and I, and, and I were invited to the White House to present this to the vice president and a whole array of top-level 
officials. Pretty good stuff for a university studio project. It was one of those great moments in my 30 years of doing studios and seminars. See, look at that, it's great stuff. You know, it's, and I, it, we, have, we have a motto at RPA, which is that just when you thought nobody was paying any attention, you know, things, things happen. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so, so and then, and then uh, yesterday Amtrak announced the first phase of this thing, which is the New York to Philadelphia phase with a new tunnel under the Hudson River. And tomorrow, the vice president's going to be announcing, you know, their, the administration's proposal, which I think will include the funding for, for at least the first part of that first phase. So uh, this is what my students describe as the economic benefits, this new economic geography, the whole set of new of, of economic benefits uh, that, you know, we, we had a great experience. We took the kids to... Uh, London last March, just at the time when the British government was making the decision to move ahead with its own high-speed rail system. They're the last place in Europe to get on this bandwagon. And we, we met with, uh, this is the, under the heading of there'll always be in England, Lord Adonis, the transport secretary. And he's a lovely guy. And, uh, you know, but he's an earl. What can I say? You know, but he's, but he's you know, not a prince of a guy, an earl of a guy, lovely guy. And we sat down with him the day before he went to, to, the, to the, House, the, the House of Lords and then the House of Commons to announce this thing. And, and it was all driven by the new economic geography arguments that, that, you know, they did their benefit cost analysis, positive benefit cost, project made sense, but where previous governments had said they can't afford to, to invest, uh, I think it's $37 billion, 37 billion pounds, which is about you know, it's about $50 billion in, the, in, in their new high-speed rail link to Birmingham, and then eventually it's about $100 billion, same thing as the Northeast, about the same distance. It was the argument that, that it created, it transformed the economic geography of the entire country in the underperforming areas in the north of England and Scotland, be pulled into the economic orbit of London and the Southeast, which is doing fabulously well. And that's the thing that put it over the top. So these are the arguments that, that we've used that got the attention of the Vice President and the administration. Um, and. Uh, uh, and this is something that maybe this interesting challenge of how do we get these, these uh, there are eight states in the Northeast Corridor, there are 13 states that are in the service area for the Northeast High Speed Rail, how do we get them to work together? We worked with the Congress a couple of years ago, there's a new, there's a new Northeast Corridor Commission, doesn't really quite do the job, you know, and you know, there's this tradition of not working together in the Northeast, and I, I got into trouble with one of my board members who's a Columbia University historian, and I, I said that, uh, that, that if we got this right, this would be the, the, the first time, you know, since the uh, uh, Bill of Rights that the northeastern states had worked together on anything. And, and he, he, you know, went like this and he said, no, no, it's not true. He said New York voted against the Bill of Rights. So, you know, so, so literally, <laughs> literally the first time. So what do we need? You know, very modest for the northeast. We need about $100 <coughs> billion dollars of uh, uh, your tax dollars, thank you, and uh, and of and of uh, you know it's about eighty, probably eighty, seventy billion, eighty billion, something that order of magnitude of public money, federal money, and about twenty or thirty billion dollars. Those nice people at Goldman Sachs and Chase, uh, J.P. Morgan, and so forth, that will we think will invest in this thing, and then we're going to take a. It's going to require a long-term commitment. If you think about it, it took us forty years to build the interstate highway system. Actually, it took us longer than that. You know, it was proposed by the by the Roosevelt administration in 1937. I'll tell you one other brief story, and then I'll stop. And that is. How am I doing time? I'm over time, right? So, okay, so far. One other brief story just on the, how planning works. So, uh, so Delano and Charles Elliott, who was, the, who was the staff director for the National Resources Planning Board, came up with this brilliant idea that there could be a, uh, a national network of limited access highways. And they figured out there was no highway trust fund. There was no gasoline tax in those days, 1937. So they figured out the only way to pay for this thing would be to set up toll roads like the ones that New York had and, uh, to, to build its parkway system and so forth. We were the only place building out the RPA's plan. We built a, the first national, the first regional network of metropolitan network of limited access highways. They were all toll roads. That's how you paid for, for highways in those days. So they came up with their national plan and, and then went to the Oval Office and presented it to the president. It was called the, the National Toll Road System. Well, an interesting thing, when they looked at where the traffic was to support uh, tolled highways, uh, the only places where it made any sense at that point was on the East Coast and the West Coast and a small area around Chicago. Kansas didn't cut it, no Kansas Turnpike on the map and so forth because there wasn't the traffic between Kansas City and, and uh, Topeka in those days and, uh, uh, and, and Manhattan. And uh, so, so it, was, it was East Coast, West Coast, little area around Chicago and that was the national uh, highway plan that they presented to the president. And President Roosevelt, and this, I've heard this story from uh, from, from Charles Elliott, who was the staff director um, for the National Resources Planning Board. The president takes this map 
on, on his de big desk in the Oval Office and turns it over and draws his own map of the United States and then puts eight north-south lines and eight east-west lines and said, gentlemen, this is the map that I want. I want a national highway system that serves the entire country. Every place in the country is going to have access to the national limited access highway system. So come back to me with a plan that does that. So a few months later, they came back with a map that was this time said of the national toll road system was called the National Toll Road and Free Road System. And it was basically 95% of what you now think of as the national limited access highway system, the interstate highway system. And it was to, uh, to be paid for, this time uh, by tolls and by, uh, by excise taxes on gasoline and diesel fuel and tires and so forth, you know, that now what we think of as the National Highway Trust Fund. Um, and uh, you know, that's how the vision happened. 1938, it took 18 years for Dwight Eisenhower to convince the Congress. And when he did it, everybody thinks this just happened, flipped a switch and so forth. He, it took him two years, the Congress said no. And they were, it was a Republican Congress and a Republican president. They said, no, we're not gonna come up with the gas tax. Who's gonna pay for that? And then Ike uh, just trimmed it back. And I think it was a two cent or four cent a gallon tax. He knew he couldn't build more than a few demonstration legs of the interstate system. And they started building uh, you know, the first legs of the interstate system in rural Missouri and, and, and rural North Carolina and places like that demonstrated the efficacy of the thing. And then two years later, Ike went back to the Congress and said, if you want the rest of the system, we're going to have to increase the gas tax. And the Congress did it. They've increased it three or four times since then. But it took us 18 years just to develop the political will to do this thing in the first place. Everybody, I think a number of people said, how can we afford it? It won't work, it won't do anything. And of course it transformed the country and it made, you know, made, made the, the US economy in the late 20th century possible. I'll leave you with one, one, and so I, that's what it's gonna take again. I don't think this is gonna be snap your fingers. It's gonna take 25 or 30 or 40 years to build this whole thing out. Hopefully it'll be on the short end of the leg so I can you know, sit, on the, sit on the veranda of the nursing home and get, feel some pride and so forth seeing it done. Uh, but you guys get to build this in your lifetimes. One last thought, and that is that, that the Interstate Highway you know, Act was the National Defense and Interstate Highway Act, 1956, and Ike, sold this to the Congress ultimately, not on the basis of an economic transformation or new mobility, but on the notion that this is what we needed to win the Cold War. And, and the argument was that we needed the interstate highway system to evacuate cities and to move army divisions and, and missiles and that sort of thing. Well, we never evacuated a single city in the event of a nuclear, you know, nuclear war. We never moved a single atomic cannon or a single missile on the interstate highway system. We never moved a single army division on the, on the interstate highway system, but it won the Cold War. It, it, it enabled a, a, uh, a five-fold increase in, in the U.S. economy between 1955 and 2005 over, you know, as I said earlier, um, the, the same kind of commitment to higher education, to research universities, to K through 12, the other things that are gonna create the new productive capacity in this country that will enable Americans to to uh, you know, have a better standard of living uh, th when we have half a billion people 25, 20, uh, 50 years from now, 40 years from now, uh, th the same standard of living, better standard of living than we have today. Uh, so that's the punchline. Thanks very much for uh, you know, long-term commitment. Thanks very much for having me. Are you okay with questions? Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah. About, it's, not done so by a it's what? It's not done so by a geographer. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, guilt, guilty as charged. Yeah. Right, okay, so I, I'm a geographer. Okay. One of the things that geographers tend to pride themselves on yeah. is, an, is a, an understanding about the interrelationship between human systems and environmental systems. And we know that in past iterations of uh, transportation investments, uh, the first rail network, had a profound transformative effect on the landscape of right. the United States right. and resource use. And we know that that deviated very substantially from, say, John Wesley Powell's recommendations to use watersheds as the basic fundamental unit for organizing our development and, and settlement of the continent. So my kind of question to you is, how are natural resource concerns being integrated into this thinking? How are you certain that the developments that were, the, I guess, the foundations that you're building for a new American economy are not going to exacerbate the problems that we know are already headed down towards us, especially water availability uh, in the number of these sectors that you're talking about, these, yeah. these clusters that you're trying to enhance? Yeah. Well, um, uh, you know, it's interesting. We're, we're, we're looking at a, a broader set of natural resource 
protection issues. And if you go to the website, you'll see uh, it's, you know, it's a fairly early stage, but we're looking at, at landscape preservation issues and watershed preservation issues. We're starting in the Northeast, but we're building a network across the country and looking at the, you know, the large landscapes, the big resource systems that need to be protected and, and uh, uh, you know, managed in a special way. Um, you know, and I've argued that you know, it, ultimately what it's going to be doing, I think, is looking at what the, the, the public estate, the network of protected landscapes, needs to be at mid-century for a country that's got a population that's 40% you know, that's, that's, uh, larger than the one that we have today. Um, we started work on, 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 on water issues, and I agree with you that it's an enormous challenge in you know, places like the Southwest or Western Kansas and so forth where we're clearly running out of water. Uh, and, and we're not there yet, but, but you know, ultimately that's going to drive, uh, you know, settlement patterns. Um, you know, the, the, you know, I suppose that the, the simple answer in a place like Southern California is that, is that you know, they'll have an economy that's, uh, that's two or three times the size of the one they have now. And uh, they will uh, get even more serious about alternative energy, and they'll be using a lot of it, and probably nukes, and they'll probably be using that to do desalination until they come up with something else. But, uh, and, and I think the thing that's already started, there's a new, uh, my, one of the co-chairs of America 2050 is, is uh, Mark Pisano, who used to run the Southern California Association of Governments, is now uh, leading an effort in, in the Southwest for a new water management plan for the Southwest. And the initial phases are gonna be, gonna be about uh, phasing out some less productive agricultural uses in the Imperial Valley and elsewhere, and you know, diverting those, uh, th those water allocations to, uh, to urban uses, long run, you know, conservation, long run desalination. I think that's where they're going to go. You know, they're just running out of Colorado River water for the Southwest, and you know, ultimately there will be limits on on how much uh, growth you can accommodate in some of these places. Uh, you know, that's probably the good news for the Great Lake states is that they got a lot of water. They don't have a lot else going in their favor at the moment, but they got a lot of water. Yeah, other questions? Got one over here. Making this happen doesn't seem to be a question of resources. I think it's more of a question of political will. Yes. I think you suggested that. Can you explain why you think that transit in general and high-speed rail specifically uh, seem to be a partisan issue, becoming a political issue? <coughs> that didn't well, I saw a statistic the other day in the Times that you know that that's, that I think put pretty pretty clearly to me, and that was the so the average uh, Republican House district uh, is 11 times less dense than the average Democratic House dis district. There it is. You know that that uh, you know Democratic districts have the population density. Now, now that's driven you know like places like San Bernardino County and you know the the you know the, the vast empty places in rural Nevada and rural Montana and so forth where you have Republican congressmen and very large. But you know, so so you take those out, and I still think you'll find that, that that it's probably three to one or four to one or something like that. And so the densities are just much lower. But the but the flip side of that is that is that we know that, um, and, and again, it's not just you know rail transit. It's 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 you know it's it's pushing, you know BRT technology and and a number of you know less expensive alternatives for small smaller rural centers. I mean, the kind of thing that Manhattan needs to be thinking about. It's not, you're not going to build build a you know, a heavy rail system or even a light rail system, but you could build a decent bus system here and you could begin to organize growth and development around it um, and, you know, and accommodate the, the, uh, accommodate the growth of, this, of this, uh, this metropolitan area, this new metropolitan area, right? Just about to be, just, just a brand new or soon, soon to be anointed as a, as a metro um, economy. You know, and I think if, if, if light rail can work in, in Phoenix and in Albuquerque and in, you know, I, I can't remember if Boise's got one of these things yet or not, but they're talking about it. But a lot of you know the small metros are moving ahead with, with transit systems, and I think even more want to do it um, and, and want to organize around it. I mean, you know, Houston is my favorite place, big, big ugly place, but uh, but Houston, you know, which is you know, the most automobile-oriented place in the world, you know, this side of of, of Bahrain or someplace. Um, you know, is now organizing its growth around around a planned network of, of five uh, rail uh, light rail lines, and uh, and focusing on a new a new uh, what what will be the the uh, Houston terminus of of the Houston to Dallas to Austin uh, uh, high speed rail network. So even Houston is is organizing its development, its mobility plans around around transit now, and that you know so that, that's that's uh, quite a long ways for you know the, the most anti-planning, you know, anti-urban place in the country. Do we have other questions? Good questions from the city? Um, you mentioned briefly um, the high-speed rail system is a 
part of a larger plan that the RPA is working on for America 2050. And I was just wondering um, what some of the other components are. Well, I mentioned some of them, and we're making, you know, we've made the most progress on the rail and transit, but the, but the idea, again, think of the high-speed rail as just the backbone of a, of a larger mobility system for the country that would focus in, in these metro areas and, and, uh, and cities that are strung along the high-speed rail lines and the connecting uh, uh, higher-speed uh, lines uh, that, would, that would, you know, it's a range of, of transit alternatives ranging from bus and bus rapid transit and the smaller places to to uh, you know, light rail and, tr and streetcars and, and, and then regional rail and rapid transit in the bigger places. Uh, so that's you know, transportation. We're looking at the big protected landscapes. We're beginning to look at water resources. Uh, we're beginning to look at energy systems and so forth. But it's, it's taken a while. You know, we're a little organization. It's a big country, so we're, we'll, we'll get around to it. My hope had been, you know, in the, and if you go to the Fishman paper, you'll see that the, the two really majestic you know, na national plans uh, were, were, were developed by Thomas Jefferson in 1808 and Theodore Roosevelt in 1908. So I thought it'd be kind of a romantic idea, you know, if the, if the federal government, you know, did a 21st century plan in 2008. Well, it came and went, it didn't happen. And, and I'm really eager to have, you know, somebody in government pick up on this idea. They haven't done it yet. And the, uh, the Bush administration didn't, the Obama administration didn't so, didn't. so, you know, we have this really interesting network of, of regional planners and architects and business leaders from across the country who are part of this network who are doing this as a kind of civic initiative. And we're taking a little bit of time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Other, we had a question over here. Yes. Yeah. Is the high speed rail been considered for evacuation of carless populations, such as those that were stranded after uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans? Well, uh, you know, we, we had a very funny situation in New Orleans, and that is, you know, Amtrak, as you may remember, got their trains out of New Orleans before the storm. So that happened, so that they weren't thinking of, you know, there, no one was thinking, you know, nobody was thinking about how to evacuate New Orleans. And, and uh, you know, it's kind of a. Um, an oversight, let's just leave it at that, you know, and, uh, um, and there's been a lot of discussion about what needs to happen differently. And, you know, we learned after, was, what was it, after the, the hurricane that hit the Texas coast uh, uh, a year later, and, uh, you know, the evacuation of Galveston and parts of Houston and so forth, there was terrible traffic jams and so forth, and they had a very hard time evacuation, uh, evacuating, you know, those, uh, those areas. I think the point is that the highway system we've found doesn't really do the whole job now. To their credit, the Eisenhower period, you know, uh, planners were thinking that we had a we had a, rail, a passenger rail system at the time in the in the 50s that was pretty good, and that if you put these systems together, why why they, they would have the potential to evacuate American cities. Uh, I think the answers you got, you know, like most other things, I said beware of single truthers. Anybody tells you that high-speed rail, I mean, I didn't suggest that we were going to be evacuating cities with these things, but you could. I mean, one of the arguments that will be, you know, that that, that is being used by Amtrak to support a new uh, a new tunnel under the Hudson River is that is that in the event of a, you know, a 9/11 type of attack, that if we needed to evacuate Manhattan in a hurry, this would be one of the ways to to do it, not by itself, because you'd have roads and conventional rail and you'd have, you know, high-speed rail and a new, a new uh, tunnel under the Hudson could help do it and ferries and all the rest of it. Yeah, back here and then we had one over here and they go back there to the, to the dean, right? So one of the interesting moves related to public versus private investment, um, if you think about Warren Buffett's purchase of the Burlington Northern State famous last year, Yeah. what do you think the potential is for a private run at this versus waiting on the public initiative to take place? Yeah. Well, we've looked at it, and I, again, I'm, you know, I've, well, I belong to a private sector group. You know, most of my board members are, are capitalists, business leaders, and so forth. And, and so we're working with uh, now with, 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 with folks from the major investment, from Goldman Sachs and the other major investment banks in New York and, and Philadelphia and Washington on, on these plans. And, and I think there's real potential for private investment and private interest and all the rigor that that brings to, to the process. And, um, uh, but the experience that you know we've seen, and we've looked very closely at this in the UK and Germany and, and Japan and other places. You can, you know, the J Japanese system, for example, the JR, they denationalized the, they privatized the national Japan railroad system, and, and created a set of regional, um, uh, you know, private rail companies that that, that uh, build and operate the high speed high speed system. But the capital costs largely came from the Japanese government. Once they, once the capital costs, you know, have are in place. 
the, these private rail companies are doing a really good job of operating uh, these things on a, on a for-profit basis. Uh, but at least, you know, our initial take on it is that, is that probably, you know, 80% of the cost is going to have, is going to have to be public. And that's, you know, we've looked at, looked at a whole range of, of European and Asian, you know, models for how these things have worked. And I've got a very creative group. We're looking at the Northeast with my Penn studio this spring. We're looking at, at, uh, you know, I described last year, we looked at the what of Northeast high-speed rail. This year, we're looking at the how and how to finance it, how to administer it, and so forth. So I got a bunch of very creative uh, uh, investment bankers work, working with us. One of the big things, and we've done, we've done some P3s in, on transit projects in the New York metropolitan area. We've done some light rail lines and, and, and bridges and so forth. And the danger here is you, the, 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 the private sector doesn't like risk. And, uh, and so the danger here is that you, if, if the government covers all of the risk, then you end up with this kind of heads we win, tails you lose proposition where, it, thank, you know, this is Mr. Buffett. I mean, Mr. Buffett's really good at sniff, sniffing out unregulated monopolies, and he's, he owns one. And, uh, and uh, nothing wrong with that. That's the finest tradition of American capitalism. But, but what, what you don't want is to have the government hedging all the risk, you know, taking all the risk, basically getting the downside and then having the, 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 the bankers get, getting all the upside. I don't think that really works. You know, so you find the, right, find the right balance. So again, I think it's probably 20 to 30% that could come from the private sector. We want them to, 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 uh, to, to complete the design, to build and operate and maintain these things, probably on long-term leases, to Amtrak or to the federal government you know, that will own the underlying asset. Um, and. Uh, you know, and eventually turn it in good, we'll, we'll lease it again. And, and, you know, we figure that probably you get, you get all of the public money back, not right away, but, but it might take uh, 60 to 80 years or so. Well, that's probably how long it'll take to pay off the interstate system. So that's about right. Or it's how long it took to pay off the, the federal investment and in the national rail system. You know, which again, we think of as this great, you know, uh, BNSF in, in San Jose was built through a public-private partnership. The government gave away what today would be how many billions, tens of billions of dollars worth of land to incentivize the, the creation of that system. I mean, you know, they, and that's nothing wrong with that. It's how it happened, and we, we just have to do that again. We have a question over here from the dean. Going back to your uh, comparisons with the, the rail lines in uh, Europe and, and Japan and all that, which I think ring very true, um, but I also get a sense that a lot of times, as you said, with your French example, people don't in the U.S. don't necessarily like us comparing ourselves in that regard. I wonder what you've done, in, uh, or if part of your argument also lies in comparing the subsidization of these other transportation uh, centers, be it airports, uh, yeah. the rail system. Because every time I pick up a paper and read a knock on the rail system, it talks about the per user subsidization of it, and of course, Every time I go through six security people at an airport, I'm thinking, well, this is being heavily subsidized too, but people don't seem to weigh that in. Is there, have you done any? Yeah, we've done a comparative analysis of the federal investments in, in, in rails, both passenger and freight, uh, in, uh, in the commercial aviation system and in the highway system. And, and the bars go like this. You know, the uh, uh, rail is down here with about a, you know, it's averaged about half a billion dollars a year for the last 40 years. The commercial aviation system is averaged, you know, I'm, I, I'd have to double check the numbers, but it's in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 billion dollars a year. And the highway system, this is just the federal share, and you look at the state and local share, it's three times the size. It's, you know, it's the neighborhood of, uh, it's hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And, and the, the problem with the rail system is not that we've oversubsidized, it's that we've undersubsidized it. And, and I would argue, let's level the playing field. Let's, uh, okay, let's knock down the subsidies for these other modes. I don't think that's the way to do it. I think we need to elevate the subsidies for rail. We need, you know, we need to do next gen air traffic control. I mentioned that. You know, and we need, you know, we, we certainly need to get, to get some new capacity on the metropolitan legs of the interstate system. And some of that can be done through tolling and and congestion pricing and so forth, you can pay for it, you know, the, the old-fashioned way. You know, so it doesn't necessarily mean that we've got to have new federal money, but we, but we've got to do all the above. And, you know, the thing is, the rest of the world's moving ahead with these investments, making these investments, and they're cleaning our clocks in terms of, you know, we used to be the most efficient place to move people and goods in the world. That's the that's our grandparents and our parents' gift to us, is we because they invested in these things. And we're now becoming one of the least efficient places to move people and goods. There's, you know, you see every, every couple of weeks you see a new report on the cost of congestion. It's in hundreds of billions of dollars a year of people sitting, sitting in traffic. And, 
and, and again, it was, you know, in the days when we were the biggest oil exporter in the world, at least we were burning American oil, but now we're burning, you know, imported oil. So it doesn't make any sense. We're paying for it about eight different ways. You know, as Paul Weirich used to say, or he one wonderful quip, he said, if the, uh, if the major export of, of Iraq had been bananas, we wouldn't be invading that country. You know, so, you know, so, so, you know, this is just getting to be a little crazy. We had one here, yeah. Uh, when I think about investment, I always think, I know there's a large initial capital expenditure, but over time, hopefully you get multiplication of the return. Yeah. Every present example we decided had a big break. And yeah. So this doesn't have that. How first you talked before about the finances about what the return is. Well, so the question is about return on investment here, the, the, you know, and. Sure, our economy, we're moving you know, from a heavy industry more to a, a service industry. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how does this fit the new kind of knowledge economy and, and so forth? And it's been interesting. I've, for the last, uh, you know, 20 years, I've been, we, when I started the regional, our third regional plan in New York, we started with, with um, these uh, futurists at, at Stanford Research Institute and DRI and others, you know, talking about this issue of, well, what happens when the Internet, you know, really kicks in? And do we really need to have Manhattan, the other Manhattan at all? Do we need to have big centers of commerce and, and so forth? And a lot of people said that, uh, that we'd all be sitting up on mountaintops in Vermont, you know, with our, with our iPads. They didn't say iPads in those days, but with our computers on our laps, and we'd be communicating with the rest of the world. Well, it didn't turn out quite that way. And it turns out that, uh, that you know, I go back to the, 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 the uh, graphic here that showed that I talked about the new economic geography, but, 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 a, but a big part of this, it turns out, for the knowledge economy is face-to-face -face communication. That's where, you know, when you look at, at how innovation happens, it's, it's, it's scientists and, and engineers and innovators, you know, sitting down face to face, and usually it's some people-friendly place. You know, it's a place like uh, Aggieville down here that, that that people sit in a coffee shop or you know or over a beer, and that's where innovation starts to starts to occur. Um, and so it turns out that these dense urban places have a, a function that's as strong as they've ever been, and that this is a way of supporting you know dense urban urban metropolitan regions and cities uh, across the country. Um, so, uh, you know, the, again, the internet supports that, but, but ultimately it's face-to-face -face -face communication, tacit knowledge that really can only be transferred, you know, from one person to another, and person doesn't go over the internet very well. You know, it means that you've got to have face-to-face -face communication. And what we're talking about doing is expanding the network of places that, you know, where face-to-face -face communication can easily occur. I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for. Where are we looking? Any other questions from the students? Do you mind if I finish with one more question? Sure, yeah. Uh, you were talking about a, a large number of uh, different people that were involved in figuring out these issues from local and national NGOs, consultant firms like ACOM, uh, the FRA, and Congress. Um, I thought you might conclude by talking about the particular role that your uh, students at, at Penn played in figuring out these ideas. Well, the Penn students have been really important. I mean, they kicked off the whole thing with this this uh, uh, discovery of these emerging, you know, mega regions, and uh, uh, and they've been doing, you know, we've been working for you know, eight years now. We've been doing these uh, studios. We've been doing. Re it's been an interesting sequence. We've been doing research seminars in the in the fall, and and Gary Hack retired a couple of years ago, and his successor, Marilyn Taylor, the new dean at Penn Design, and I have been teaching these research seminars in the fall, followed by the studios in the spring. And so we, you know, we've been doing work uh, actually, I don't say, it's more or less commissioned by US DOT and the FRA. They've, they've, they've given us a set of research questions that they want investigated. And we've put together uh, these, uh, you know, uh, each student has taken on, or teams of students have taken on research questions in each fall for the last couple of years. And those have been turned into, uh, into these books that have, that have been used by FRA, and, they, and they're actually using it. It's kind of fun to go down there and see, see that they're out on the, on the, you know, the, they're out on the desks in the, in the assistant secretary and deputy secretary's offices and so forth. Um, and then in the spring, we've done these studios that, you know, that, that have been looking at, we've kind of homing in, you know, dropping out of the clouds and looking at the particulars of the Northeast, and we'll, we'll do more in the future. Uh, and this year, we're, this spring, we're looking at the financial questions of how to make these P3s, public-private partnerships work, and, and so forth, and the institutional arrangements. Um, 
So uh, the students have been right in the center of all of this. And again, you know, when we've had the meetings with uh, the governor and the vice president and the members of Congress, I mean, the students are going to be there tomorrow with Biden, Joe Biden, and uh, uh, at the invitation of the secretary's office. I thought that was kind of fun. I think they got tired. What, what she said to me is, we're getting tired of looking at middle-aged men, so don't you come. But she said, yeah, you're invited, but I really want your students, you know, to, to be there. And uh, so, so the... So the uh, they're, they're finding this to be a really refreshing kind of arrangement to have a bunch of young uh, professionals in training to, to be doing cutting edge research. That's really what, that's what you guys do here at, uh, you know, uh, in Manhattan. It's what we do in Philadelphia and Manhattan. And uh, uh, it's part of this great tradition of universities uh, and students at universities doing cutting edge research for the benefit of society. That's what the land grant system was about. You know, it's what, that's why we, created institutions like this one. So I know you guys are doing the same kind of work here and should be doing more, could, do, could be doing more. 